Hello, everyone. This is Ruben Fleischer. I am the director of Uncharted, and I will be sharing with you my thoughts on the film as we watch it here together. I appreciate anyone who's listening to this as director's commentaries, I think, with DVDs going away are not as popular as they once were. But I know for myself, I learned so much watching some of my favorite films and hearing the director's insights into the process of making it. And so for anyone listening, I hope I can offer some insight to you as well. That was the PlayStation logo, their first ever PlayStation logo, or maybe not their first ever, but the latest and greatest. And uh, this was a big deal for Sony bringing a video game property that they own through Naughty Dog, which is one of their studios, which is exclusive to the PlayStation, and then trying to use that as the inspiration for a feature film that would then be released by Sony. I felt very proud to direct this as the first premier Sony title that encompasses both PlayStation and the feature film division and is a beloved game by all. And speaking of loved, Tom Holland uh, at the center of it was a big incentive. He's someone who I've loved watching everything he's done. So the opportunity to work with him was kind of a dream come true. This movie was shot in the summer of 2020 in Berlin. This scene itself was shot in a parking lot outside of this Babelsberg studio in Berlin. And our second unit director, Scott Rogers, was really ingenious in the way that he rigged these boxes in this whole sequence. We used um, these things called KUKA arms, which are robotic arms that you would recognize from the floor of a automobile factory. And um, the boxes were put on top of them and they were controlled by a computer. So they moved in sync and could do cool things like spin and shake. And then we had Tom and his stunt doubles on wires um, traveling between the, the boxes. We had a great pre that was done by the third floor as a template or guideline that we followed, but so much of it was created by Tom, myself, Scott on the day, finding those special moments um, to make it the most exciting it possibly could be. But I love the flash forward device for films generally and was really stoked to include this one where it concludes with him getting knocked out with no parachute. And after all of that, getting back in the plane, all that effort, he's left and he's knocked back out. And then I, I also am proud of that transition to the flashback so that you get a flash forward, a flashback, and then soon after this, we'll find Tom in the present. But I think it's a great way to introduce the character as to where he's going to get to and where he started many years ago with his brother on this quest to find a link to their history as well as to Magellan and his gold, but the ring that ties them to Francis Drake, as well as many other of the themes of the movie are established in this opening. First guy to sail around the world. These actors are both terrific and we felt very lucky to find both Kiernan and Rudy to bring these roles to life. Rudy has a spirit of a young River Phoenix and I think resembles him. Uh, and Tiernan is just a really, really talented young actor who, who came in and uh, just captured the spirit of Nathan Drake, a young Nathan Drake, both the excitement, the innocence, the wide-eyed wonder, but also, you know, he's got an edge to him. He's got attitude and... Um, and he's, I think, you know, resembles Tom Holland, which helps. One thing, uh, you know, little movie magic is that Rudy and Tierney are actually exactly the same height. So we had to make Tierney shorter and 
the way we did that was by making Rudy taller. So Rudy's yeah. standing on an apple box yeah, exactly. through, you know, we had to run, even for when they're walking, we had to put a little pathway of apple boxes for Rudy to walk on so that he was always, you know, a foot taller than Tierney, even though in real life, they're the same height. And if you go back and look at the hanging scene, that was the only one in which we couldn't really change Tierney's height. So you'll notice he's pretty long and lean as he dangles off that balcony. But from that point forward, we just made sure through camera angles or other things to just make sure he was always a head shorter than Rudy, even though in real life, they're exactly the same height. So for example, in this one, the cop and Rudy are both standing on boxes, which is why we can't see their feet. And uh, that makes Tyrion seem shorter. So a little movie magic, can't just let them take about as old school as it gets because it was just Apple boxes, no VFX or anything like that. This was all shot in Madrid. Um, this was a school, an art school that plays as their dormitory. The museum was an actual museum, a naval museum that we were very lucky to shoot at because it had so much of that history already inside of it. And they actually had an exhibit on Magellan and his journey within this Naval Museum. Always be with you. But I think a really good introduction to our heroes and it's really important to have established this bond between Sam and Nate because ultimately Nate's journey is a quest to find his brother. Uh, who he hasn't seen since this day that we're watching here because once he went off to find his fortune sam never looked back and kind of left his brother alone and so when sully approaches nate and offers him the opportunity to go find the treasure he's more importantly offering him the opportunity to find his brother and that's ultimately why nate goes on the journey as excited as he is about the five billion in gold and Magellan's treasure, what matters most to him is finding his brother. This is a great setup and payoff. Um, the lighter gag where the secret message is revealed. And this was actually done practically with lemon juice, which is a cool trick that you can try at home. But it's a nice payoff down the road when Nate realizes that his postcard might have some secret message in it as well. And then of course the ring, which we see throughout, we don't ever really learn the true history of it or its lineage, but that's something I'm excited to explore. And the next film is getting closer to the story of Francis Drake and their history. I'm proud of that transition. It's a relatively familiar morph, but the way that we did it bringing in some of those lighting gags and having the the train kind of appear simultaneously made it made it look cooler than your typical morph. And this is just now establishing Tom and his world. We intend this to be, you know, New York City, but it was shot in the Kreuzberg neighborhood of Berlin, which bears a remarkable resemblance to Manhattan. That kitty got wet. Uh, sign is a nod to the game. That's a saying from one of the games that any true fan will recognize. And we we're proud to feature it as a neon sign on the wall of this bar that is actually a coffee shop in Berlin. This actress, super talented uh, British actress who came and helped us out in Berlin. And her accent, I think, is spot on American, as is Tom's needs to say. Tom is not a trained bartender. However, he did uh, practice for weeks, if not months, leading up to the film in order to be able to do all those cool tricks. Um, and he had several different flair bartender coaches, which if you haven't worked or met a flair bartender coach before, I don't know that you've truly lived. Uh, they are a unique and very particular breed of person. This movie was shot by Chung Hoon Chung, our DP, who I had worked with on Zombieland 2. He's immensely talented in one of his most well-known and beloved movies is the uh, original Old Boy. And I've been a fan of his for a long time and was very excited to work with him again on this film. And 
I think that interior bar lighting looks spectacular, as does this exterior night scene, and it's just a testament to his talent. Another uh, big collaborator on this film was Shepard Frankel, who is our production designer, who had the ability to transform spaces, including this coffee shop, into the you know most hip downtown New York bar. But you know the scale of this production design, whether it's the boats, the caves, um, the churches, every all the sets, every set I stepped on, I was just absolutely blown away. Here, of course, is uh, Mark Wahlberg in his introduction as Sully. In the trailers, there was a scene where Tom and Mark actually meet prior to this, and that was scripted and we shot it. In the end, we thought this was a little bit more of an interesting uh, character introduction for Sully because he's, you know, just kind of keeping an eye on Tom and and uh, is there waiting for him as opposed to the funny banter at the bar, uh, which is a great scene and you can watch it in the deleted scenes and is a really, I think, charming interaction between the two. But in the scope of the film, this felt like a more intriguing entrance for Sully and slightly more mysterious, which is a key aspect of his character. Mark is someone who I've been a fan of his work since Boogie Nights. I've really, really just always wanted to work with him. I think he's underrated in that he's a giant movie star, but I don't think people appreciate just how talented he is. He's what I would call a Swiss army knife in that he can do anything. His action capabilities are as good as anybody's. As we all know from the big uh, Transformers franchises and so many action movies he's been in, but he is funnier than most comedians and is truly hilarious. His improv is incredible. You know, he's been in The Other Guys, Ted, some of the biggest comedies of all time and funniest movies of all time. But then he's also an incredible dramatic actor and has shown that by working with, you know, Scorsese and David O. Russell and just. He's unparalleled in his versatility, his screen presence. He's just, he's really just such an impressive and experienced actor who brings so much to the table. And I think is a, a great foil for Tom in establishing that classic older, younger guy dynamic. It always kind of evoked Han and Luke for me. And that was a bit of a touchstone for me uh, in terms of Nate's innocence and eagerness about becoming some part of something bigger than himself. It's not unlike the experience of Luke, who has been on a distant planet and gets the opportunity to be at the center of a galactic battle. His character, Nate, has been living in relative obscurity as an orphan, you know, just doing these petty heists, stealing bracelets and whatnot. But uh, it's, in fact, Sully who offers him the opportunity in this scene to go find this fortune he's been dreaming about since he was a little kid and to um, kind of leave his relatively small town existence, even though it's New York City. Uh, he's never been out of the country. He's never been on these types of adventures. And so this is a, a classic call to action scene. Uh, if you're a student of Joseph Campbell, Nate will deny the call, which is another step in the path of our hero's journey, because he is not comfortable with his relationship with his brother. And this is the moment in which we first are introduced to the Mancadas and Antonio Banderas's character in the a bit of the history of the treasure. Um, we meet our adversary, if only in pictures, and we understand the exposition of the movie, which is that this treasure exists and these guys are going to find it. I think that this is a pretty artfully scripted exposition scene. Um, sometimes it can be really tedious in terms of just having to convey the information to the audience, but these actors and the writers are all so talented that I think you're so invested in Nate and his experience of meeting Sully and going to this mysterious apartment and the incredible design of it and all these little details that it's not 
it's not tedious or boring. It's actually fascinating. And hopefully audiences are leaning in as they learn about our heroes and what they're, what they're up against in this uh, adventure. And then of course, this is the mention of Sam, the first mention of Sam that Sully has a relationship with them and that we find out that Nate actually hasn't seen him since that flashback scene. And there's, there's a little bit of bad blood, at least from the younger bro brother's perspective as to why his brother hasn't been in touch with him. We'll learn, you know, trust is a big theme in this movie. And we will learn later that Sully's just using Nate because he thinks he has a piece of information. But I think it's interesting that Nate also withholds information from Sully in the scene. Sully says specifically, you haven't heard from him, not even a postcard. And then we'll find out that Ta sorry, Nate was um, withholding the information from him. And then he goes back and he, he's kind of packed away his memories, his childhood, any connection to his brother. And along with that are these postcards that his brother's been sending him for the last 15 years. It's interesting to me that Nate has enough of a spidey sense to know that he can't fully trust Sully. And so he withholds this information from him and he doesn't share it with him throughout the whole film. There's another little Easter egg, which is a sticker for Naughty Dog, um, the game maker, which I thought was a, a nice little detail for fans. But yeah, here are the postcards, which are at the center of the film uh, and will obviously pay off towards the end when the message that Sam has secretly sent Nate with his invisible ink Nate has had the answer all along, but it's only upon the journey that he's able to identify it. So this is this is where you know the hero is originally denied the call, but then upon reflection realizes that this past that he's packed away, including the ring, which is so important to his brother and his family, he's now going to step up and answer the call and let Sully know that he's on board. For this adventure. Love Tom's little smile here, which hey, kid. I think suggests his excitement and was a, a, a nod to our producer, Alex Gartner, who when we were shooting this, we did a few takes of it and then asked just, can we just see a little smile at the excitement? And it was totally a good suggestion that Tom took and I think makes that moment all the more resonant. This scene was shot outside of the telecom building where we staged the auction house in Berlin. We shot this with very little time. Like I think we had two hours total to film this whole scene and we were up against the light. This was the end of the day. But Tom and Mark had this scene so dialed in. We did like five takes, something like that. And um, it works really well. And I love the, the banter that they share throughout the film, but this is really the first back and forth with the, uh, uh, you know, you got to bring something to the table and what are you going to do with that kind of money? Both these guys are really naturally funny and I think are so dialed in on their characters that all of the back and forth, all of the rapport, the banter, that's for me the fun of the movie, the heart of the movie, the heart of the relationship. And it's just so terrific when you have two actors who are so capable that they can improve upon the script, offer their own ad libs, and just constantly elevate the material. Some people, not myself, called this the beefcake montage with no disrespect to Tom. It is an incredible showcase of his physique, which he worked really hard on. Uh, in preparation for this film. And I think it's impressive, not only the amount of push-ups he can do and rope climbing, but just his commitment to the character and wanting to make sure that he resembles the video game character. And that I think this is Tom's first big, big role outside of Spider-Man. And he really stepped up to the plate and, and brought it all and was so prepared physically, mentally, You'll see throughout the film, he does all of his own stunts, the action, you know, I don't think he's ever done anything quite like it. And so 
I'll point out throughout this film all the moments where it's actually Tom Holland, you know, doing something death defying and he didn't come to play. He definitely came came ready to do what was asked and just wanted to be at the center of all the action. And he's just so physically capable. You know, he's practically a stuntman himself in terms of some of the things he could do. I was preserving some artifacts from a museum in Baghdad. When I was over the max load weight, crashed pretty hard. They got all upset, kicked me out. Bit of an overreaction, but what are you going to do? You say preserving, but you mean looting, right? Well, if I didn't take them, somebody else would have. You asked for that? This cat joke ended up being one of the bigger laughs in the movie and has great, you know, callbacks throughout the film. On paper, I always thought it was super funny, but I never could have expected it would land quite the way it did. Um, but I love, it's so silly, but I love that this cat ended up getting some of the biggest laughs in the film, both this one and then the one at the very end when he pokes his head out of that backpack are huge laughs. And uh, it's so silly to have these kind of macho dudes and this runner of this cat. And we try to get the kind of cutest, fluffiest cat that we could find. Hello? Hello? I can hear you, I'm sitting right next to you. Oh shit, I think I pushed it in too far. Is that okay? Let's go. Again, this banter here, if I can hear you, I'm sitting right next to you, just completely cements, you know, their relationship and the dynamic. For what it's worth, that dialogue that was inside the car was shot on a green screen in a stage in Berlin. And then we cut to them and they're on the streets outside in Berlin. But yeah, we uh, actually know that, that that car stuff was shot in a green screen in Spain, as I recall. But uh, we employed a lot of visual effects throughout this movie, plenty of green screens. But this is our most practical location and set piece. Everything that you'll see, for the most part, was done in this environment. We had four days to film this entire auction sequence. And it was a lot to do. We had second unit and first unit working simultaneously. I would be shooting one thing in a little area and they would be hanging somebody off that chandelier. This is our introduction to Braddock, who we think is uh, perhaps arm candy for Moncada. And also I should mention, this is Moncada's first on-camera uh, scene. This actress, Tati Gabrielle, is someone that I wasn't familiar with prior to filming the movie. She auditioned along with many, many other people. And I just was struck by her performance, her screen presence, her beauty, needless to say. And then also this very arresting look of uh, the short blonde hair. She had had this look for a television show and her hair had grown out and was long and curly. But myself in the studio loved this kind of striking appearance so much that we ended up making a wig of the blonde short haired look. And so throughout the film, she's wearing a wig which adds time and complication, but we really wanted that look. And she had dyed her hair and bleached her hair and messed with her hair so much that actually she couldn't do it anymore. It was literally falling out. So we created the, the wig to achieve that look. And I think it's very striking. I also love the single arm sleeve tattoo, which I just think adds interest in uh, to her, her character. I love this scene between Tom and Antonio. Prior to my involvement with the film, there was never a scene actually between our hero and our villain where they meet face to face. And I felt like that was a mistake. And so I asked the writers to come up with a scene where we could kind of see them in a quote game, recognized game situation where Tom uh, could kind of see who he's up against and the audience could see these two incredible actors pitted against each other in person, because if you notice for throughout the rest of the film, they are never in the same place at the same time. So the, I thought it was important to have a scene at least where they kind of sum each other up. This movie was shot entirely at the middle of the pandemic. This was originally slated to film March 16th of 2020. March 12th was I think when Tom Hanks got COVID and 
March 16th was pretty much the day the world shut down. Uh, so it was, so it was um, pretty unexpected that this pandemic would happen. Obviously, it was unexpected, but we were in Europe filming, and at the time, it was way worse in Europe than it was in America, and so we were kind of at the center of it all. Okay, let's get started then with lot number one, a magnificent we had oil the actors in town, we had a lot of the sets built, we were ready to shoot, but we all left for three months and went back home while we figured out what to do with the pandemic. That allowed us time to continue to work on the script, to continue to storyboard and previs our action sequences and refine them. But then we went back to Berlin in the summer of July, 2020. And it was the middle of pandemic. You know, we were one of the first big movies to film during the pandemic. It was all new ground for everyone involved, testing every day, wearing masks on set. And this scene, I mentioned this all because this scene has I think 200 extras in it, at least. It was originally intended to have more, but 200 was the maximum. I think might have even been 150. But to stage a big auction scene like this indoors in the midst of a pandemic was unproven ground that we kind of had to navigate. And um, safety was always at the center of everything we did. But due to testing, quarantining or sequestering the extras and just everyone on the crew being very responsible and thoughtful about everyone else we managed to get through the whole movie without having to shut down at all due to a positive case which is not to say that we didn't have any positive cases it just was never any of the actors or anyone who was indispensable to the production so if, for example, a camera operator, or a carpenter, or a painter, or somebody got COVID, we were able to find replacements. But when you're doing 200 people in a room together, you know, that just made everyone nervous. So we were particularly careful and responsible during this time and wanted just to ensure safety for all involved. I, uh, I'm really proud, though, that we managed to complete the production so successfully and so safely. And it's a testament to Sony, our COVID team, the accountability and responsibility of every crew and cast member involved who really, you know, put the movie ahead of all else. Like people, I think, were very responsible because they knew their actions affected others. And I'm grateful for everyone's commitment uh, to the film. I love that little scene with uh, the Scotsman, meeting him for the first time, hearing him speak. The uh, That reaction that Tom has in the control room is a huge laugh for the film and uh, I think establishes the tone, as does that moment where Nate has no choice but to charge these two mountainous men. Just instantly lands on his back. Our stunt here is uh, all practical. That was... Uh, Stuntman making the leap. Actually, no, it wasn't. I take that back. That was Tom Holland making the leap. Uh, and Tom Holland hanging from the lights. This is all Tom Holland in the actual environment, hanging obviously on a wire, but hanging 100 feet off the ground from the chandelier. It's once it falls apart that he got some help from the stunt team. But everything else was all him, which I just think is so impressive. I. I'm scared of heights, and so whenever we scouted this location, I was always nervous look, looking over the balconies. These two close-ups are only visual effects in the whole sequence, which uh, is Tom against a green screen just with the moving background behind him. So those are one little cheats. Everything else was either Tom or his stunt guys actually hanging from that incredible chandelier that we put in there. Again, a testament to Shepard Frankel and his talent um, designing that and to our our special effects coordinator, Uli, a German uh, crew member who extraordinarily talented and built that whole rig. Because of the pandemic, we didn't have a ton of time and there was supply chain issues and everything else that comes with the pandemic. And so a lot of things were kind of very last minute without as much time as we would have preferred to rehearse and to 
do, but just the professionalism of the entire crew allowed us to achieve some of these visuals and these action and stunts despite all odds. And it's just, again, a testament to Scott Rogers, our uh, second director slash stunt coordinator, his entire rigging team, and the practical special effects crew for a lot of these moments. Um, I love this shot. It's a one -er. It's not long, but it, it's just nice that we don't cut and we just kind of see in the background as the door closes this woman who's incredibly physically imposing, taking down three guards uh, like it's nothing. So I think a great intro for Braddock and how lethal she is. But I, but I also am proud of that shot and how it's kind of happening in the background as Mark exits the scene. Again, this is... Um, uh, shot on green screen. I think our, all of our VFX look terrific, but these green screen driving shots, I think, are... you don't trust me? Oh, is that supposed to be... There's no way you would know that they're not uh, real due to the interactive lighting that Chung Hoon put in the environment. And then our incredible VFX supervisor, Chaz Jarrett, who oversaw everything um, on the VFX side. Dineg was our principal vendor, not our sole vendor, but our, I would say they did the lion's share of the work. This map was done by a separate party called Alma Mater, who's a visual effects slash motion graphics company that does a lot of titles for movies. And they did all of our on-screen titles in our maps, and they did a lot of the on-screen graphics for computers and stuff. This was shot in a small propeller plane in a small airport outside of Berlin. And then there's a sketch here. Okay. It was meant to be, there was a whole setup that, you know, they were kind of stowing away in this plane that with an old army buddy of Sully's that all got kind of lost. So I, I don't know what audiences make of this scene, but we did meet the pilot who was Mark Standin, Cowboy, who's been a stand-in forever. We cast him as the pilot, but just due to time, we just cut to the middle of the scene without all the head of it. Um, so if you notice in the background behind Tom, there's some like boxes with labels saying, you know, whatever. But the intention is that he's a smuggler, this pilot, and that Nate and Sully have stowed away uh, on his plane to sneak into Spain. But whether or not that ever finds its way into the story or that people surmise it from the circumstances, uh, I'm not sure. This is uh, our introduction to Chloe who's kind of the female lead slash adversary for Nate. Sophia Ali plays her. She's terrific and I think really brought so much to the character. There's a fun Easter egg here in that behind her, that guy with the tall guy with the blonde hair is, his name's my same name, Ruben, and he's one of the biggest gamers in Spain uh, who we had visit the set. And then the peop two guys he's talking to are Art and Matt, the writers of the film, Mark and Ben Holloway, who wrote, among other things, the first Iron Man, and are just all around the world's best guys and super extraordinarily talented writers responsible with, uh, you know, scripting this film. Like me, they weren't the first writers on the job. Uh, I was certainly not the first director on the job but we were the people who were here on set seeing the movie through. You let it take across? They're phenomenally talented and were on set with us every day, just helping make the movie better, solving problems, coming up with lines. Just, just really terrific. This whole sequence was shot in three days, this entire scene um, from Sophia's introduction to this chase ending in the fountain a drive off. And this was, uh, again, first unit and second unit working together. When we were up here on the roof, they were down shooting stunt guys in the um, fountain. While we were down doing the fountain with Tom and Sophia, they were up top at the doubles shooting this jump. That was a face replacement shot. That wasn't really Tom making the, the fall, but his stunt double, Greg, and he replaced his face digitally. Um, but I just love the scale of this location, allowing us to see all Barcelona. Obviously, the palace in the background is really impressive. These fountains, as soon as I saw this location, I was like, this is where we have to shoot it. And then we designed this foot chase to 
kind of features some of the more interesting aspects of the location, which were the rooftop, the steps, and then the fountain. Yeah, we shot this in just three days, which is a lot to do in a little time. But I think uh, was was uh, turned out really well despite it. And again, all of these extras are people, or all the people in the background are people that we brought in. So again, in the midst of a pandemic in Spain and Barcelona, we had, I think, several hundred extras. We apparently tested 700 people just in this one day between the cast, the crew, the extras. There were 700 people working to execute this scene, which is a lot at any time, but especially in the midst of a pandemic. The auction house Mercado called it an altar crucifix. I didn't think about it then, but it means the cross was originally made to stand on an altar. But our, we had a local um, production company aiding us with all of the Spain location stuff, whether it was in Barcelona, Madrid, or the south of Spain. Incredible um, collaborators, great filmmakers, all of our Spanish crew, and just Again, having to figure out the logistics of a film of this scale in the midst of a pandemic is not an easy feat. So sincere appreciation to everybody involved who was able to help us make it happen. I love the uh, Santa Maria del P of it all. That was something that was scripted in the, in the, in the script, that it was Santa Maria del P and this whole gag of the tree and of the pine and just the fact that it's a real church that's been there for 900 years and that we we're able to shoot in the church uh the actual church the santa maria del p and throughout the church there is that iconography of the tree you can see it there i don't know there's something really special when you're shooting a location that that's old similar to this one which is called el born which is a Victorian market, from my understanding, that they wanted to turn into a library. And when they went to, you know, update it and, and install the foundation, they dug it up and they found this whole, you know, city of old Barcelona that was 600 years below this market. And so they made it an archaeological site and a historical center for Barcelona, which seemed very appropriate in terms of Moncada and the family's history and the foundation that they're a part of this combination of the history being so present in the day to day and the juxtaposition of a very modern building with the ancient at the same time. It, it really felt super appropriate for the Makata family. And I just got to say the casting of uh, Antonio's father is something that I I think is a cool story and I'm proud of is that yes. there were several, you know, very prestigious Spanish actors who we had in consideration to play the father role. And I just turned to Antonio and said, you know, this, this guy's going to be your father. I found my cross. Who, who would you like to play? And he chose Manuel because he had seen him, Antonio had seen him perform Shakespeare when he was in theater school. And he said he was always the most imposing and formidable actor on stage and that he always admired him, but had never had the chance to work with him. And so it was basically Antonio who cast his father. And I love that backstory to the relationship. And I know it was a treat for both of them to work together as, um, Antonio, I'm sure, had always in, admired Manuel de Blas, and I think Manuel was just very flattered that, you know, Antonio, who's at this point the patron saint of Spain, was, you know, hand-selected him to play his father. So that was a really nice thing. Come on to, you know, Sally. This location was incredible. It's all a practical apartment in Barcelona that overlooks the Gothic Quarter. There's a scene on the deleted scenes that you can watch where there's a bit of a, it follows the scene immediately where Nate and Chloe walk off and they go onto the balcony and there's a little backstory on Chloe and a little bit of a flirtation between the two. In the end, um, 
you know, this movie is so chock full of adventure and everything else. The love story that existed originally between Nate and Chloe just kind of felt a little extraneous or gratuitous. And I think both myself and the studio and test audiences all agreed that it was better served with some tension, but not as much as was originally intended. So you can watch that deleted scene on the balcony and see that we kind of repurpose aspects of it and put it into their dialogue in the catacombs later, which was, which was a, I think a good call. It helps keep the movie speeding along, but also it just feels more inherent to the nature of the characters that they they wouldn't be stopping so much to have romance in the midst of these high stakes. Just a quick note about shooting at the Sagrada Familia, which is probably the most famous building in Spain, and what a treat it was to have the opportunity to film right there in the park opposite this iconic cathedral. Uh, I felt very, very fortunate to be able to shoot at all the locations in this movie, but particularly one as special as this. And if you've never visited it, I couldn't recommend more going inside. Uh, it's truly one of the most impressive buildings I've ever stepped foot in. This scene was added just to kind of show just how ruthless Antonio is. He's willing to, or his character is, he's willing to do anything to get the treasure, even if that means uh, killing his own father. We felt that Mancata, without that scene, was just kind of like a, you know, a businessman who wanted the treasure he felt he was due, which there's no harm in that and doesn't make him especially um, terrible. But once you kill your father, that's that's about as bad as it gets. So it kind of helped bolster him as the villain of the film. That none reference is a reference to Indiana Jones. There's a couple nods to that film, which is obviously the biggest influence on our film. It's also my favorite movie ever made and I've watched it many, many times. I think it's a perfect film. I love the tone. I love the performances. The shots in it are incredible and it just captures the spirit of adventure and treasure hunting better than anything I've ever seen. And I'm sure it was a huge influence on the Uncharted games. And then Full Circle was a influence on the film. So we felt it would be appropriate to give it some shout outs. And so there's that nod. That's a reference to the snakes line from Indiana Jones. And then later we'll actually hear him refer to Chloe as Indiana Jones. Um, we wanted to let the audience know that we're aware of the parallels between our film and that one. And if anything, it's a celebration of how amazing, um, you know, Spielberg, Harrison Ford, the entire cast and, and just that whole um, trilogy is. This set here is um, a set. Everything prior was the actual cathedral, but this little crypt we built on stage in Berlin and was actually our first day of filming with Sophia, Mark and Tom all together. Um, incredible production design, needless to say, it really felt like we were standing in a cathedral and what I love about this scene more than anything is, again, just the banter um, that we'll see in a, a, a little bit between Mark and Tom, all the jokes when he turns it the wrong way, I don't have my glasses. I mean, we have so many alts to those lines that Mark came up with on the day. The skeleton gag was a suggestion Tom made when we rehearsed it. He felt like just turning the keys was a little too easy and he felt that he needed an extra step to solve the puzzle. And so he suggested that they all look around and he find this button, which I love this moment and um, the notion that it's a purgatory between heaven and hell, I thought was really in spirit with the, the puzzle that they're solving and the clues that, that, that are there, the heaven and hell of it all. And a winged skeleton evokes purgatory, but just again, a testament to Tom's instincts as an actor He's thinking about the movie as a whole and approaches it as a fan of the, the games and the genre, just always looking to make it as interesting and make, make it as hard as possible for our heroes, you know, always putting obstacles in their way so nothing's too easy. 
which is a great instinct. And I was grateful to have him kind of as a second set of eyes, always ensuring that we were constantly elevating the film. These crosses, uh, you can't imagine the amount of versions of the crosses that we had uh, designed to lead us to this. The interlocking component was a late addition to it, as well as them functioning as compasses in the final scene. There, I have them on my, my shelf here at home just because I think they're such an incredible object. And, uh, you know, the bejeweled golden crosses um, that are also function as keys and are and end up being the key to the treasure at the end. Just a great prop from any movie. And um, it's those kind of details that in the design of it with all the inscriptions and jewels that just add an authenticity and and just, you know, it's those special things that make movies what they are. But I love the comedy that plays in this scene, both that moment as well as when he looks at the, the phone, comments on how many apps he has open, which was always one of my favorite lines from the script and just shows the generational divide between Nate and Sully, but also in real life between Tom and Mark. They both leaned into those aspects of the characters as well as to the comedy and the interplay between the two and um, the banter. You know, so much of this was just them on the day kind of giving each other a hard time that it, it makes the movie special and makes the characters' relationship sing. Um, so I was so thrilled as this was one of the very first days of filming. I'm pretty sure it was in our first week. And as soon as I saw the chemistry working as well as it did, I just knew that we had something special um, because Mark and Tom and Sophia are all such special actors and are so capable with both drama and comedy that I, I it just got me really, really excited for all that lay in store because this scene confirmed that we're off to a great start. I think we shot that scene in a day and a half. You would be surprised by just all the different camera angles that we had to do to achieve it. So Mark is outside in Spain. Uh, this is really Spain, Barcelona and the Gothic Quarter once again, shot over the course of several nights. But Tom and Sophia are actually in our stage in Berlin, walking through this incredible set that was all practical. You know, we had several hundred feet of catacombs that they were winding their way through. This uh, moment with the spears was in and out of the film. And first I thought it wasn't funny enough to make it into it, but then we showed it to audiences and they really responded. And so it found its way back into the movie. Yeah, so that's the editing process is you're constantly trying different things and um, playing them for an audience to see how they land. And when it comes to comedy, I feel like there's no better measure than, you know, putting it in front of people and seeing if they laugh, because that, at the end of the day, is the deciding factor. If it lands and, and works, it works. This is a little bit of a fun fact. This scene was shot during reshoots. Like I mentioned, originally it was on the balcony, a lot of this content of the scene, but then we decided to put it in the catacombs. The only issue was that Sophia was in Australia shooting a television show, and Tom was in Madrid with us for the reshoots. And so we had to shoot this entire scene with them on two different continents. So um, we shot Tom and we rebuilt the catacombs and shot his side in, in Madrid with a stand-in for Eyeline for, for Chloe. And then we shot Sophia in Australia against green screen. Now we're back to the original photography because they had been navigating the catacombs and this is back to their, now they're in the same scene. But for that scene, I had to direct Sophia remotely over an iPad. She was with the crew in Australia against green screen filming that. And I was uh, at home in New Jersey offering her guidance. And then we composite it all together. You would never know that they were shot at two separate times in two different continents. It feels like they're in the same place at the same time, but that is the joy of movie magic. That big bat creature is kind of an odd thing, but he's a real street performer in Barcelona that people know and you would recognize. And so we're happy to feature him, but uh, certainly a very strange uh, character to have in the middle of the movie.
I can't hear one thing you're saying. Come on, let's go. Yeah, this definitely doesn't look right. Look, above the bar. Inferno. Isn't that Latin for hell? Yeah, it is. Come on. I'm so legit. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's Braddock's back. What? We better keep moving. This, uh, this scene I love, when I read the script, I just thought it was so cool that you have this juxtaposition of the ancient world with the modern, and it feels like there's nothing that's a greater juxtaposition than a nightclub set in an old Roman uh, room. This was shot at this very famous techno club in Berlin called Tresor. This was a day and a half of shooting. This was one of my more stressful days of shooting. But again, just due to the professionalism of all involved, we managed to get out unscathed and um, the extras were all sequestered in a hotel so that, and everyone was tested. I love this fight sequence again, setups and payoffs are a huge part of movies. And, you know, we saw Tom be a bartender when we first meet him in his character introduction at the bar. And we know he has these skills. So getting to call that back later and see him use those skills in a new way with this fight, I think just distinguish the action of the fight and make it really special. And again, a testament to Tom's commitment, just being able to, you know, do all these bottle spins and whatnot in the midst of a hand to hand fight. Um, it's pretty impressive. So he, uh, you know, did all of his own stunts for this sequence. And uh, I also love when you're able to inject comedy in the middle of a, uh, a fight. And so having these moments of character in the midst of all the action is what, what I love. And it's especially great when you have someone who's so capable with both so that, you know, he can change gears from doing some pretty impressive action to uh you know throw a punchline god those guys suck pingy who plays hugo uh i haven't mentioned he's a stuntman slash actor who we found and uh although he doesn't have any lines in the film that was always the nature of his character i think he has a huge presence and was a delight to work with from beginning to end this well sequence was the our last two days of shooting or was it one day i can't remember in Berlin and it, you wouldn't imagine how complicated it is to shoot, you know, in water, especially when people are submerged entirely. Oh, up. The abyss was a big reference for what happens with Tom and Sophia. But one interesting thing is when you're shooting a water level rising, instead of having it, as you would expect with the static set and then just having water come in, come in, come in. What you do is you build a tank and then you submerge a lot of water. the set into the water, which is both for safety and repeatability. Um, so as the water starts coming in, that's actually our set being uh, dropped down into the water. So as they're freaking out, the water's rising, their set is actually descending into a pool of water and our cameras are locked to the sets so it appears as if the water is coming up and in fact they are coming down we're running out of time i found it excuse me guys oh. Oh. this uh was shot separately even though they're simultaneous this was one of our first action sequences that we shot in the movie it was great to have you know mark who's just so capable with action doing largely all of his own stunts in this. And then Tati, who hadn't done a lot of action prior to this, trained incredibly hard to be prepared for this fight sequence and was so dialed in. So much of this is uh, her actually performing her stunts. It was a bit longer originally, this fight sequence. We ended up trimming it down just because at the end of the day, kicking and punching, as some would like to say, is not as interesting as other things. But um, again, I love the character that we've infused. We also get a sense of these two characters' backstory and history um, prior to the film, you know, what led them to here, and we'll later find out, you know, it all ties back to Sam. But um, this was choreographed by Scott and his super talented fight coordinators, but the idea of dropping the cross was a trick that an old stuntman had taught Scott that if ever you're in a bar fight, someone comes at you, you drop the beer. <laughs> if they're squaring up against you, you drop a beer because naturally their eyes will follow it and use that as an opportunity to sock them. So we stole the old stuntman's trick and Sully drops the cross to distract 
Braddock, who can't help but let her eyes follow it, and then he's able to use that moment to uh, disarm her. The Crambit, which is the name of the knife she has, is a very distinctive weapon that, I forget if that was in the script or how we arrived at it, but uh, very specific to Southeast Asia and to our film Braddock, and is just a really distinctive weapon that I love and Tati wields ferociously. But yeah, this was really fun. Again, just seeing Mark and Tati together uh, as this was a key relationship in the film and watching them work together very early days of shooting and knowing how well this chemistry was and how great they both were at action. Um, I think that's our only stunt double for Tati right there was a face replacement. She was on a wire. The glass is all CG. This was done practically. This is again a set in Berlin. Tom and Sophia were wet for at least a day. I haven't done a lot of underwater stuff, so this was cool for me just to learn and kind of appreciate it, but it's also stressful because you're putting your actors underwater. Um, luckily, you know, our entire stunt team and underwater team was very experienced, so there was no risk whatsoever. Safety was always at the forefront, but um, just a cool visual, and I love it the way it's lit by those flashlights underwater and just a really tense and riveting scene that I think our actors did a terrific job with. And for what it's worth, this little set that they're in here, it's a testament to just everything that production design, the art department did to make it feel so real. The layers of, you know, grit and grime and the stone, which was all carved from styrofoam and everything about this little set, which was just Priscinium, meaning there weren't four walls. We could only shoot one direction on it uh, as it had been designed that way. Just even a little set like that just so, looks so real and feels so authentic. And now they're entering into perhaps what is my favorite set, which is the Roman antechamber and then the Roman treasure room. But I just love all the roots and the layers of um, dirt and grime of you know 500 years of history that are here. It's it's pretty awesome. I also love how great a practical torch looks in a movie and uh, how great it does a job of, you know, lighting our actors. You can see it go from kind of monochromatic to full color when that flame is lit and the orange glow that it puts on their faces, I think is just so special. There's a little scene uh, with Sully and Braddock that took place in that courtyard prior to Sully getting to the grate. Uh, actually, after he gets to the grate, he's interrupted by Braddock that I believe is in the deleted scenes if you want to go look. But we cut it out for time and also a little bit of believability. She had him dead to rights by gunshot. And he ends up jumping down the, that hole of the grate. And it just felt like she would have killed him. So we felt it undermined Braddock as a character. If she really wanted to kill him, how could he escape that? Being at point blank gunshot range twice. So we, we took it out for that. But I believe you can watch that and delete scenes. Uh, courtyard was incredible. It was, uh, again, in Barcelona. But the church that's behind Sully had bullet holes left over from the Spanish Civil War. You can see them there in the background of the fountain. It was just a really special location, and I love the, again, just following the clues of the treasure, the iconography, having solved, like, this ladder puzzle, putting the two keys together. Uh, it really pays off the uh, the heaven and hell of it all. The only regret about cutting that scene with Braddock and Sully is that there was a great stunt um, that Sully's stunt double performed where he fell 20 feet down into those steps that Sophia's standing on there. Um, and it was a really funny moment. We did a kind of a match move where it looked just like Mark himself had fallen down because there's no cut. A stunt double falls and Mark stands up. And it was a really nice moment. But again, sometimes you got to kill babies and that was one of them. Uh, I love the comedy of that moment when she says, typical Sully in the, the cross lands. I worked really hard to get the timing of that right. And you can ask our editors. By the way, I should mention Chris Lebenzahn Joseph Kirkland, as well as Rick Pearson, our editors of this film, who you know, I think I were. From beginning to end of this film, I was involved for two years, but they were on for at least a year and a half. And 
who worked every single day of that time on this movie. And there's no one more talented or more committed than our editorial team and all of our assistants and VFX editors who work so hard to make this movie what it is. You would think that the production side of things is the hardest amount of work, but in reality, post is where directors spend the bulk of their time. And, you know, I, I was on this for at least 15 months of editing and the effects and just trying to get everything right. And uh, Chris is one of the most accomplished editors in the business, having cut everything from the original Top Gun, the Midnight Run, to most of Tony Scott's movies, if not all, as well as many of Tim Burton's movies. And I'm just a huge fan of him as a person and of his talent. And Joseph Kirkland, who's his assistant editor and co-editor on this film, uh, they were my real partners in post. And you know, we worked tirelessly to make sure this film hit on every level. The combination of editorial and VFX are consistent throughout this movie. For example, this was a practical set that has a matte painting behind it. There's obviously CG enhancement to this moment. When the crack comes, that's all of the VFX crack. It was just a sticker on the urn that Tom was looking at, and that was replaced with full cracks. And then those are CG breaks. We did do a practical break. Uh, again, respect to Uli, our, our special effects coordinator, but um, it just didn't have quite the impact that I wanted. So we ended up replacing the practical break with uh, all CG urns and salt coming down. But this set was just incredible, both the way it was designed and the way it was lit. And I think the way we shot it, you know, we, the fact that they come out of that little grate on the one, they enter into the antechamber, that big wood door with all the gears on it is blocking their path. They were able to solve the puzzle and then they walk right into this environment, which was largely lit by practical torches. Those urns were really there. They were about eight feet tall. It just was, when you're a kid thinking one day you might want to be a director, you dream about opportunities to shoot in sets like this and just, you know, as a huge fan of Raiders of the Lost Ark, this was just an absolute dream come true. I also think this is when the movie's really firing on all cylinders. This hopefully turn that audiences don't see coming of uh, Chloe double-crossing Nate is a, a moment that when I watched the movie with the audience, I actually heard an audible gasp and someone said, no, she didn't, uh, to the screen, which made me really proud that the... Um, the turn had worked and people actually didn't see it coming. Uh, and we really get the nature of Chloe, that she's a woman who will do whatever it takes to get what she wants, but it's not, not due to anything other than experiences that at every course of her life, over the course of her life, she was constantly betrayed by people. And so she grew a hard skin and she learned that the only way she could get ahead was by not trusting people and pulling one over on people. And, it ends up being her downfall in the third act um, because Nate anticipates her double cross and gives her the wrong coordinates. But um, yeah, I think this is a really incredible performance by Sophia and that fall that Tom takes is noteworthy because he didn't use his hands. He really acted like he was knocked out and he took the fall right on the chin, which if you watch it again, you'll notice that, uh, yeah, he has nothing protecting him. And uh, that movie star face went face first into the ground and a testament to his commitment because that's not an easy thing to do is to just take it on the chin as they say this scene is one of my all-time favorites in the film largely due to the performances of these two actors who are as good at drama as they are you know comedy and everything else and I just feel like they're both just at their very best. But I'm also proud because when we rehearsed it, they stood this close to each other. And I, my instincts told me it was wrong that they would be this close. But they were both committed to, you know, really go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, literally, in this scene. And then my trusty DP, Chung Hoon, uh, said that he thought it was terrific that they were so close and so static. And so we designed this scene, you know, if you watch it, so it starts wider and then gets progressively tighter and tighter until we get to these incredibly close close-ups um, as we build the tension and the drama of the scene. And so I think 
editorially, we did a good job of, you know, starting wide, coming to this medium. There's a two shot uh, that kind of shows them in the same space prior to the extreme close ups. But as you can see, they're, you know, six inches apart from each other. This is the two shot. And then we go to these screaming close ups right here, which just when you watch it on a big screen is absolutely riveting. And, uh, you know, their performances, you don't need to do fancy cam work or do anything else when you have performances like this. You just show the actors and their great performances as close as possible. And, and you can even notice the tear uh, from Tom in, in this final take. And it's, uh, it's really powerful. It ends with this walk-off, which starts as a two-shot, and Mark turns into this nice close-up, which I think is a really nice moment. And then um, him all alone with nothing but salt. And I pitched the idea of him grabbing a handful of it and letting it slip through his fingers, which Mark was kind to indulge. But I think it's kind of maybe a little cheesy, but I think it sums up uh, the moment for him is that literally the gold had slipped through his fingers and he's all alone with nothing but his salt. And it, it seemed appropriate. This scene, um, when we shot it, I was convinced there was no way it would be in the movie because it has our audience ahead of our actors or our characters. So... The audience is finding out the betrayal and that Sophia, or sorry, Chloe is working for Mankata prior to the next scene in which Sully figures it out. But one, if you have Antonio Banderas in a movie, you don't want to cut out scenes that he's in because he's just so great in every moment. And there's nuances in that performance of that scene that I just love. But two, I think just for from a pure storytelling perspective, Understanding that Chloe betrayed Nate, Nate and Sully so that she could work for Mankata and that, you know, she's the one now in charge, that she's undermined Braddock. That kind of fuels Braddock's fire for what's to come when she ultimately usurps Mankata. Um, so I was convinced when we shot it that it would never be in the movie, and I kind of raced through it because I, I, I thought I was so smart in that, um, you know, we didn't want our audiences to be ahead of our our heroes. But in the end, editorially, I'm so glad that we did shoot it because it is an important pivotal scene to just fill in the audience as to what's happening. And also, like I said, fuel Braddock's fire for taking out Mankata. This scene, I think, is another great performance by Mark and Tom, where you really get the dynamic. And this is uh, a scene in which I would say the student becomes the teacher. And, and it's really, you know, Nate stepping into his own, laying the ground rules for Sully and saying, I need to find my brother. That's what's important to me. You're a piece of garbage. I don't care about you. I'm just doing this for personal reasons now. And whereas Sully had been leading the charge prior to that moment, this is where it all changes. And, um, and now Sully is, uh, you know, subordinate to Nate. This scene I, I'm proud of because this was shot in a really small airport outside of Barcelona, where we shot the interior of the private plane in a hangar. The same day we shot this scene, but um, it's entirely VFX, the environment, which I think these are some of the most impressive VFX when you don't know to even look for them. Um, but hopefully there'll be on the DVD some visual effects before and afters, and you can see that you know, we had Mankata's car and we had some of these extras walking around as crew people and mercs and whatnot, but that entire plane, the entire airport, everything is all digital matte paintings that were um, added later. This was also shot at the same little airport. We just rolled over some of these staircases and shot it. So we did three scenes in one day, which was a lot. Um, and so we kind of had to shoot them all pretty quickly and, and uh, just maximize them. But Again, a testament to DNAG that, you know, all we had was a ramp. All right, come on, hey, get ready to go. There'd be a giant cargo plane, as well as the entire environment of the airport. This uh, cargo plane was uh, built, the interior was built on stage in Babelsberg. Babelsberg is one of the, if not the oldest, continually running film studios in the world. Um, 
Fritz Lang's Metropolis, which if you haven't seen, I highly recommend watching, was shot there. I think Greta Garbo's early work before she came to Hollywood was shot there. During World War II, the Nazis used it for propaganda. And then it became a part of Eastern Europe uh, once Germany was separated. And I think the Soviets or East Germans used it for propaganda films during that time. You may want to check my history, but this is what I was told. And now it's returned to its former glory as a proper film studio. And I think they shot The Matrix there and some John Wick's movies and um, Uncharted. And so it's in Potsdam, which is outside of Berlin and was just an absolutely great place to work. The German crew was incredible. The talent and commitment uh, of the entire crew, you can see the results on screen, just the art department, the detail of some of our sets and locations. But this uh, interior of the C-17 was pretty impressive. And Antonio is actually pretty impressive with this performance. It's a hugely uh, riveting moment, I think, both hearing his daddy issues kind of aired out for the first time. Uh, and just every take he did was, was different and interesting in its own way and just delightful to watch a master at work. And I love featuring incredibly talented actors and close-ups to really get all the nuances of their performance. And when he brings it here, you know, it gives me goosebumps. Um, but I'm also really proud of the uh, how unexpected this moment is that Brad takes him out. I think when you have a movie star like Antonio, you don't expect him to uh, be killed, you know, at the end of the second act. You would expect to see our heroes take him out. Um, but I think uh, this is a nice turn and certainly lets us know how ruthless Braddock is. And, uh, and uh, in the script was one of my favorite moments. Where's Fraser? No loose ends. Making this a PG-13 movie, which it was always intended to be, we certainly had more graphic, bloodier versions, and we had uh, more graphic seeing the knife slit his throat. But the end, I think totally this film really landed as a four quadrant film, meaning it's fun for all audiences. Um, they say eight to 80 as our demographic. And I really, I really believe that. I think this is a movie that plays for everyone. And so while we did limit the violence on screen, I think you get the point. You don't need to see a throat slit, you know, with your very own eyes. And um, I think it was the right decision to make this movie appeal to as broad an audience as it can, because apart from that violence, there's really nothing you know, that can't be seen by younger audiences in this movie. And I'm really, I think we made the right decision in just choosing a more tasteful path for the, for the violence. This um, sequence is another one I'm really proud of, just the action that's about to pop off. It's uh, a lot of practical elements combined with CG as they're kind of doing this cat and mouse through the back of the plane. All these boxes are practical and they were actually there. But once they start moving throughout the, the C-17, they're quickly replaced with, with CG boxes, and we used all different kinds of methods to have our actors navigate these sliding boxes, whether it was two stunt guys with a blue screen, you know, running at people for them to avoid, or rubber boxes that they could bounce off of. We, we really used every trick in the book. That's an all CG shot, the one of the ropes. This uh, obviously is CG. Mark becomes a digi double as he flies out the plane. That box that hits the guy is CG as is the parachute. And this is where we get into CG boxes, which, you know, if you pull an audience, no one would ever know that so much of this is done CG. That's actually Tom Holland getting yanked out of a back of the plane by way of a ratchet, which was a great shot that uh, Scott Rogers, our second director shot, conceived of. And as soon as he shot it, he said, this will be in the trailer. And he was absolutely right, because it's a great moment to see a movie star yanked out of a plane. Um, this is all CG enhancement and shot practically with lots of fans on our plane set. But then anything outside of the plane is all VFX. Uh, 
These are digi doubles that go flying out of the plane. That, both those guys are digis. That's real Tom hanging from a box. That's real Tom. I think that's digi Tom flying backwards, head over heels. Fraser, drop the gun. And then this was a great little moment that uh, as we were designing the action, the sequence, um, the old gas can trick has been done a ton of times, but um, Chung Hoon came with a great way to do it where we don't lay it out all behind it. We see her see the flares and then next thing you know, one's flying at Braddock, which forces her back, allowing her to slide across the uh, Mercedes and get to safety. I love intercutting these two sequences. Originally, we kept them separate. Tom component of the scene was only done at the beginning of the film and then we stayed with the action inside the plane. But then um, as the cut evolved, we realized that connecting the two moments which the audience had already seen, for example, this box flying out and taking out the Merc that they'd seen in the cold open. It was really satisfying to appreciate that it was Chloe who had pushed the box out and that's the one that takes out the Merc. And then it's Chloe that again is in the, the car that's driving her way out of the plane and then hitting uh, Nate and taking him with her. This sequence was the most challenging both probably shooting wise and visual effects wise in the whole movie because it's so technical to try and do a one or uh, which is a shot without a cut. It's actually seven different shots all combined editorially and with VFX to make it feel like it's one shot. But for example, she dives off here, that's a digital double and there's a cut in there as we pan back to Tom. This is now a new cut. He jumps off the Mercedes and then quickly becomes a digital double, which is a CG version of himself up until impact. And then he now is Tom Holland again. That's real Tom Holland there floating through back to digi double. And then that's really Chloe Sophia grabbing him. This is digi double. And then we join back to real Tom Holland somewhere around here uh, where he's hanging off the side of the box. And then again, when he pulls the chute, this becomes a digi double up until the camera finds him above. So we used all these tricks of going, weaving between practical photography and a digital double to achieve this sequence, which was over a year of visual effects to get from being shot and to its final form. It was just a lot of computer power to um, make that happen. This joke is, it's rare that you can get a joke with a title, but um, it was originally somewhere in the band of sea and then, and then we had the thought to separate them. So just somewhere, which gets a laugh, and then we fill in the band of sea below. But it, it's nice to me when you can find humor with the simplest of tricks like a title. Anywhere I can find a joke or add humor or entertainment to the movie, I will go for it. So this was shot in the Mediterranean Sea. I know it, it says that it's in the South Pacific in the Band of Sea, but we actually shot this in the Mediterranean, the South of Spain, where we also shot Tom on the boat and Sophia on the boat in the cave. But this was pretty cool just because we really did shoot them floating on a box in the middle of the ocean. What you don't see is in that wide shot, there were two rafts alongside the box where the crew was, and it was just a fun day of filming out on the open sea. That's a matte painting of the hotel. This was actually a beach that was right next to the beach that Braddock and the bad guys show up on later in the film. Fell out of a car that fell out of a plane? Huh. You know, something like that happened to me once. And this is Nolan North, who is the voice of Nathan Drake from the video games. Good luck. He's one of the coolest guys I've met, and just uh, being able to feature him in this cameo was so fun for everyone involved and i know for tom especially but you know we really do want to just pay tribute to the the uncharted games and more than anyone no one's responsible for creating the character of nathan drake and so we felt very lucky to be able to have him in the movie and i think for fans at one of the test screenings there was a guy behind me who you know as soon as he heard his voice knew exactly who that was and elbowed his friends and said that's the guy from the uncharted games um, so I, I'm glad that fans can appreciate it. What do you think? This was our actual first day of filming. Um, this Nate 
and Chloe seen in the hotel, our very, very first day of filming the whole movie. Well, not where she's looking anyway. You can't imagine the amount of conversations I had about that golden tree stump behind them. I thought it was so weird and gaudy and distracting, but the art department prevailed and it is in the background and I finally admitted they were right. It is a nice detail and a beat like this. That this was, uh, there was a joke that we cut out at the head of this scene where they're being brought into the, the hotel room the honeymoon suite and the bellboy kind of says this was reserved for uh you know our most esteemed guests and also you because the idea was that it was the only suite left and they used sully's credit card to pay for it um which if anyone asks how did they get such a fancy fancy suite that's the answer to the question is that he lifted sully's wallet when they were in the car and uh paid for it that way but yeah, I love this little montage. I love all the details, shots. And then again, just a testament to Tom Holland and his thinking about the audience in the games. Uh, originally, it was he just, you know, uses the lighter to get the secret message from Sam and then boom, he knew where it was. But it was um, Tom's instinct to add a little bit more challenge. So instead of just saying where the treasure was buried in the postcard, we added in this extra layer of complication, which is the keys are your compass, your keys are your compass. And then it was Tom's idea also that we use the keys kind of as compasses to be placed on two specific points in the map and where they intersect is the, uh, the X marks the spot treasure moment. So that Braddock and anyone who had the real map um, thought they were going to the right place in the Cala de Oro, but in reality, um, they didn't know that there was this extra layer of protection that the Spanish explorers had put in place, Elcano's crew, just to protect themselves from, you know, anyone ever getting the map and it falling into the wrong hands. So we added in this moment, which I think plays so well of Nate having to find this little point within the ruby. Um, this was done like, you know, days before we shot. So the props department had to add this needle and remove the jewel and everything, but it worked out really well. Um, and I love this moment when the two crosses meet and the, the X marks the spot cave is revealed this moment that we're about to watch. Um, it's just so satisfying. and. And uh, while this whole sequence of having to solve the treasure hunt and figure out where the treasure's buried is a small kind of inside moment, you know, far from spectacular relative to all the action in the movie, it really lands and you feel Nate's excitement and you feel like this journey, you know, has paid off. And you also just appreciate, you know, how clever he is, that he was the one who was able to solve all these things. and. In writing these coordinates, hopefully this works for all audiences. You know, that last look to Chloe, it's, we see him write it and that's meant to suggest, can he trust her? And uh, we'll later learn that he cannot. This is the beach I mentioned where the hotel was, was literally just right next door. So in one direction, we were on a deserted island. And in the other direction, we were at a fancy hotel in the South Pacific. So. That's a movie making magic that you always try and get the most out of some location. And in that case, we had two beaches in the script. And so we used one beach to, to play both parts. Yeah, this moment where she finds it again, I, I was nervous that the audience would be ahead of Nate and it would make him look silly. But when we didn't include this scene, um, there was confusion as to what Chloe actually did. So seeing um, her take the coordinates and while you don't actually see her screw him over, we it's suggested that she's got something on her mind. And when we read the note, uh, we learn that she has indeed um, taken off early to go get the treasure herself. But then when we come up with this note that was left in the bottle of the real coordinates hidden from her, um, and Tom, you know, saying that only one shame on you, line, uh, 
he he lets us know that he he's not going to be suckered again. And just a uh, fun fact, it was Chung Hoon suggested putting that note in the bottle, which was a cool idea. And again, that was all shot day one and two, I think, of the production, which is the very end of the movie, shooting at the very beginning, which is never the best way to go about things, but it all worked out in this case. So this location was um, near Denia in the south of Spain, and that's a real cave that exists that um, we were so grateful to find. I mean, it's epic. It, it, you just can't believe that it exists. We, you know, it had been scripted as a cave, um, but then when you actually get to go shoot there, it's incredible. Scouting it for the first time, I was blown away. And then when we brought Tom there, like you couldn't believe it. The water I will mention was very cold. This was October in Spain, and so he had like a small wetsuit on underneath his um, clothes, his wardrobe. But uh, it was quite chilly. So that is all practical, Tom, in a real underground cave in Spain. And then now we cut to our set in Germany. And this was a stage that we built a water tank on. And a lot of this environment is all CG. So that rocket that he's standing on is real, the water's real, but this entire cave here is all done with the effects. Those boats aren't actually there. Um, if you look behind Tom, those stalactites or mites are, that was a set piece that was built, but everything else is entirely CG, except for the water. And they even made the water look more uh, kind of blue in South Pacific. These boats are there. These are real boats and real sand in that same stage. That's just a blue screen behind them. But they only built the base of the boat. So. Um, they only built probably about 15 or 20 feet of the boats, the hulls of them, but all this netting and all the crow's nest and all that, that is um, CG. And that shot, that POV shot was not a real shot. That was a CG shot. Um, but this boat that he's touching and climbing on, they built it up to the deck. Um, and it was only half the boat, I should mention. Both sides of this uh, that face each other were there. This cannon was there. But the uh, the backsides of the boats, the other side of the boats, were not built. So the combination of practical and the effects to achieve this incredible moment where Nate finally finds Magellan's lost boats. This was a stage set also in Germany, also very early on in the course of shooting. An incredible environment. When we locked up for, in March, when we shut down the movie due to COVID, this set had been built and dressed because it was gonna be one of the first things that we shot in the original schedule. And so when I came back in July, you know, several months later, it was exactly how we'd left it with all the same dressing. And of all the sets, this one actually benefited from the time because all that dust and must and moss and everything else that they'd put in there only got added to by real dust and must of having been left for three or four months uh, undisturbed. But yeah, this was a another just great scene between Tom and Mark uh, with some real great performances and also some great humor. But, you know, I think Nate, Sully's done nothing but betray Nate throughout the movie. And um, the moment where Sully tells Nate uh, that he was proud of him, that his brother would be proud of him, is a moment that we added during reshoot. So we had shot this whole scene, but it felt like Sully never really gave Nate credit or acknowledged the fact that he had betrayed him and left him both on the helicopter and you know had lied to him the whole time. And so it felt really important that in order to go fight together in the third act. So that shot right there with Mark is against green screen. That was a just a few lines that we added, and, and this shot on Tom is also against green screen. So we had shot the whole scene practically, but just knew that we needed Sully to give Nate credit and, and acknowledge that his brother would be proud of him. And uh, and so we wrote that exchange, shot against green screen, and then composited it into the existing scene which I think was really important because it allows them to have this moment of comedy where they're giving each other 
a hard time again. If it hadn't been for that moment where Sully kind of, you know, gives Nate the appropriate respect, I don't know that we could have instantly gone to humor and them fighting together because Nate would still be angry with Sully for having, you know, kind of screwed him over at every turn. So it's little things like that, which are cool to be able to do as you're tuning a movie in post. Just dial in little moments like that into a pre-existing scheme scene. And with the advent of visual effects, we don't have to rebuild the whole set. We had plates that we had shot from the original shoot and we could just shoot our actors against green screen in the same wardrobe and make it seem like they were in the, um, you know, at that same moment. The only difference was that Nate, uh, sorry, Mark had put on a bunch of weight for a movie that he did in the interim. So he was about 25 pounds heavier uh, for the reshoot than he was when we originally shot. Mark's always in great shape, but he put on weight for a character. And so there, you can see his face, you know, fill out in just those reshoot moments. But I don't think anyone uh, who's really immersed in this story will notice that, but I do, I watch it. But I think, again, the VFX and the actors and everybody involved did a great job of maintaining the reality of that moment. And I think that that exchange only made the scene better and the movie better. These were, um, we call this our Merc montage, where all the Mercs are getting the boats ready to be lifted. I truly believe in the suspension of disbelief in films, um, but certain you know, purists have noted that a helicopter like this may or may not be able to lift just something as heavy as an ancient pirate ship out of a, a hole with just a few ratchet straps. I'm of the mind that it's a movie and you know you go with it and if you're immersed in the story then you shouldn't let things like physics or gravity uh, hold you back. Um, but I do acknowledge that it was a bit of a stretch. So in designing the helicopters, which are entirely CG, uh, from the outside, the cockpits themselves are practical, but the helicopters are CG. We made sure to make them as robust as possible and put a bunch of engines on them and other things so that we could believe that they could support the weight of such a massive thing as an ancient boat that's been in a cave for 500 years. So you'll notice these. These are based off of real cargo helicopters, but we just you know, tried to make them as a uh, tough and strong as we possibly could with uh, additional jet engines and things to support the weight of the boat. So this begins our, what we call the boat battle sequence. That's a practical cockpit and that's a CG helicopter and a CG boat. This is an incredible mix of practical uh, shooting and then CG and also first unit and second unit because so many of these stunts were done by Scott and we really were leapfrogging around between the two units. And luckily we had the roadmap of our previs to follow, but so much of this is uh, you know, a combination of different tools. So for example, here is a practical uh, shot of them on a set in the back lot of Babelsberg, our two heroes scoping out the boat the boat is on the ground um this is a purely cg shot that's a cg mark Wahlberg flying in and kicking that mark and then this fight is largely practical but all of the backgrounds obviously are cg and there we did have a helicopter go to thailand and shoot reference plates of thailand and we actually had intended to use them but uh it ended up being more practical and cost-effective and I think time-saving to just have DNEG build an entirely CG environment off of that footage that uh, they had filmed. So they recreated all the little islands. The little ones are called Karsks, which is a word I never knew before this film. But all of the backgrounds off of the boat, the water, the islands, the sky, everything is entirely CG and built in a computer, obviously based off of real environments but it's all cg so if i didn't like where an island was i was like hey can you move that island a little to the left and they could do that um you know the water surface the reflectivity all that they could adjust even you know where the sun was relative to it um because over the course of this sequence the sun sets so you know we could dial the sun up or down um, make it more 
blue or more um, sunsetty. This is a real Mark Wahlberg climbing some ropes on our pirate ship set, but then the tilt up is all CG. That helicopter in the top of the the rigging and everything else is CG. I like that Jack Sparrow joke. I laugh every time. And then this is a real Mark Wahlberg on a helicopter set climbing across, but then in the wide shot, everything that's not the helicopter or Mark Wahlberg is CG. This is a digi double falling and getting crumpled like a rag doll. And so, yeah, this entire sequence is a, a great combination of practical and visual effects. When I read this, it just evoked the Goonies and other, you know, just kind of awesome movies from years past. I love, you know, pirate movies. I love the Pirates franchise, um, but I certainly had never seen a pirate battle done in midair. And I thought as soon as I read the script that this was truly one of the most original and epic third act action sequences that I'd ever imagined. And I was convinced that this would just be, you know, completely riveting for audiences. And it proved to be the case. It's the most well-liked sequence in our movie. And it's just a testament to, you know, the hard work of all of our storyboard artists, our previs artists, our stunt coordinators, our riggers, our second unit director, our VFX supervisor, and all the VFX teams who worked for months and months and months, if not longer to make all this look so good. Cause you know, there's, there's moments in here that I forget that this was just a boat shot on a, in a parking lot in Germany. And that is not an actual boat flying above the ground. This set, this little moment uh, I added where they fight down below deck. Cause we had that incredible set that we used for the face off with Nate and Sully. And I was like, well, it would be great in the midst of the action of the third act to have the action bleed back down. So we kind of devised it so the boats would collide, that Nate would fall below deck and allows for this moment when he puts on his holster and becomes the Nathan Drake that we know and love from the video games. We even included the score from um, the video game here as a callback to the source material. And I should mention we use the score uh, from the video game when Nolan North is in the movie and as a little nod to the Uncharted franchise. The composer of this movie, Ramin Diwali, is probably best known for Game of Thrones, but he's done so many incredible films and television shows um, and was just an absolute fantastic partner. I originally had intended the score to be super traditional, more John Williams, very orchestral, and that was the, the kind of thing that we had talked about. But over the course of editing, it just felt a little tired having such a tra traditional score. So we asked for me kind of halfway through having written all the music to update it with more modern elements, whether that was electronic drums or, you know, guitars and things. And he just was the most um, collaborative and agreeable partner and you know, he probably wrote this score three different times to get it to its final place and just put in so much hard work and did such an incredible job. I was talking through the slow-mo sequence, but I love that moment. Slow-mo is something I've used going back to the original Zombieland. I just love the effect it has. And so it was great to be able to kind of have a distinct moment in the midst of all this action where we slow things down and see it going so slowly. And I love um, both the way it was shot with that overhead shot of Nate falling and having Tom actually do his real stunt. And then all the CG enhancements and the wide shots to make those look slow-mo as well. And I also like the sound design, a lot of that. The uh, mixers of this movie, we had quite a few different ones, but I was lucky to work with Kevin O'Connell again, who's mixed the last few movies I've done and is literally the world's greatest film mixer. No big commercial film has been released without him putting a stamp on it. I feel like he's done all the Spider-Man movies and you name it, he's done it. Just an incredibly talented and collaborative partner who puts the icing on the cake as it were when we do our final mixes for the film. And our sound department as a whole deserves credit. Um, this is my 
fifth movie working with Kami Asgar, who's our sound supervisor. He's the man. And Aaron Oakley, who works with him, is started off just doing ADR with us, and there's no one better in the world at that, but she also is I'm a sound supervisor and is one of my favorite collaborators to work with. Uh, those guys are the most level-headed. You can't shake them, and they're beyond talented and resourceful in terms of contributing to the sound of the movie, which is such an important part of it. The mix process is one of my favorite steps of the journey, and it's nice that it's at the end, so you can really just celebrate the film and you know put on the finishing touches and. When you hear this movie in a big theater with Atmos, uh, full surround sound, it just is so uh, exhilarating, honestly, to watch the sequences. Incredible between the score, the helicopters. You know, it just really puts you on the edge of your seat, which is what you want out of a big movie like this. And there's so many people, whether it's the stunt department or the VFX department or sound department, as I mentioned, that help make it that way um, but probably at the center of it all is our editors who are responsible for the pace of the cutting constantly ratcheting up the tension you know these quicker cuts there's a, a momentum that happens over the course of this sequence where it just starts to get faster and faster cuts as you'll notice here the sound is following its lead you know there's a huge ratcheting up uh, here of the sound uh, as he climbs, just creating even more tension, because this is really the, you know, the final life or death moment for our heroes. It, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. He has this untrustworthy Sully on the other end. He doesn't know if he's going to save him, and ultimately Sully decides to do the right thing, and that's to give up the gold and to rescue his new pal. And I think it's really poetic that he decides to let the gold go in order to save his pal because we know that Sully cares about nothing more than gold but by the end of the movie he cares about Nate a little bit more than the gold so this is a really satisfying conclusion to Sully's arc it's a unprecedented um, conclusion to the villain of the movie I've never seen a boat drop on someone's head before but it certainly is impactful to say the least and then this moment I think is really Touching just being able to see Magellan's ship return to its former glory after 500 years. It's able to set sail one final time. I love that shot of the sails unfurling. I should mention it's all entirely CG. That is a computer made boat on computer made water with computer made sails. And the destruction of the boat is, uh, I think, also really satisfying the way that this mass falls right to camera. And we even get a little splash of water on the lens. And then as it kind of meets its fate at the bottom of the ocean, we could just get a diving rig. Nate and Sully those guys. realize that they don't have a chance of salvaging it because the Philippine government is on its way. This was added, that moment was kind of added later. Because originally we had a ending with Chloe where she's diving below water and actually scavenging some gold. And Nate and Sully didn't have any gold. This final sequence in the cockpit here was a reshoot. It was only We only did, I think, three days of reshoots with Mark and Tom. And it was all very small strategic stuff, like I mentioned before. But this was the... This was... This and the tag, which will come, are the two biggest components of the reshoots. And um, it, we figured out in the end that, you know, Nate giving Sully gold was the appropriate conclusion to their arc, was that Sully sacrificed for Nate. So Nate had stashed away some gold to give to Sully. And I think it's a great conclusion. And I'm really glad we reshot it. So originally, Chloe was the only one with the gold because she was, she was, going down to the treasure and taking it off the boat. We actually shot her scuba diving or snorkeling and free diving into getting the gold. And then her being on the boat and spotting them was a reshoot as well that she did in Australia and I remotely directed during um, the pandemic. But Mark's expression here and the way he plays the scene of just uh, being dumbfounded that Nate actually managed to get what he cares most about, which is the gold. 
is a really nice performance on Mark's part. And then this moment with the gum is also, I think, a great turn. And it was Mark's instinct to throw it out the window. Uh, that wasn't scripted, but I think it totally lands. And it's a really nice beat to know that, you know, it's not just this saccharine uh, buddy moment, but that we're always subverting it and having him, you know, throw away the kind gesture that Nate had made. And then they fly off into the sunset in their helicopter as the the boat uh, meets its watery fate. This is um, the Sam tag here, which we shot during principal photography. And I felt was always important to keep Sam alive because in the video games, he's alive. And um, the question was whether or not we wanted to reveal that here in this film or in future films. but. As fans of the game will know, Sam is alive in the series. And if we're lucky enough to make sequels, we'll always intend to feature him at some point. So it was important to me that we see him before just having him show up in a later movie. It's like, wait, that guy was dead. Why is he back? And that was a logic that didn't make sense to me. So I think it's important that we see him and can anticipate him in future movies. Uh, this title sequence was designed by Method Studio, and I was really happy with the way it turned out. It was kind of a last minute thing. There was another concept uh, that didn't come to fruition, and Method stepped in and delivered this sequence, which I think is really elegant and artful, and uh, showcases some of my favorite moments from the movie, and, uh, and also has a really nice, distinctive visual style. So I'm grateful for that collaboration. I worked with a guy called Ben Conrad, did all the titles for every movie prior to this. Uh, and I was sad not to have the opportunity to work with him again, but was thrilled with the with this sequence that Method delivered. There's one more tag scene, which I'll talk through, but, but prior to that, I just want to thank anyone who's still listening to this for um, listening to and appreciating all that went into making this film. It was a true labor of love. They just don't make movies like this any, anymore. You know, there hasn't been a great kind of treasure hunt adventure film in a long time. And I feel very, very lucky to be the person who got to make this one as it's a genre that I truly love. And I think is like just a pure cinematic genre, a, a movie genre. It's like, it has a little bit of why I love movies and and to get to work with this cast that we see before us and, and such a you know cool title as Uncharted, which has such a great video game history. I just felt incredibly lucky to have the opportunity. So this was our other big reshoot. Um, we had a tag with Mark and Tom and the cat prior, but it just was uh, pretty anemic compared to this. It was just two guys at a table talking. There wasn't much action or intrigue, and it felt like kind of a lackluster conclusion to the film. So we're super lucky to get to shoot this and incredibly lucky to have Pilu Azbek play our, our villain in this scene, who you may recognize from Game of Thrones, just a super talented and cool Danish actor who came and played for it with us for this day. And we, it was really important to us to have the mustache featured in the film. One of the biggest complaints from fans was that Sully didn't have a mustache. He did actually have a mustache in the previous version of this tag. So we had always intended to feature it at the end of the movie. But as this was a story about the evolution of these two characters, Nate and Sully, our instinct was that he didn't need to have the mustache yet. And that was something he could build to. And so... This is a suggestion of the Sully to come in future films. And you'll recognize both Nate and Sully's wardrobe from the games. It's very true to the games. And then um, the ending of the movie uh, where they walk out and we don't see what we see uh, was something we went back and forth a lot on. But I'm really happy with the way that we conclude the film, not only with the cat and the callback to that, which is truly one of the biggest laughs in the movie, that moment right there where the cat sticks its head out of the bag but also having them run out and being stopped in their tracks and Nate delivering his signature line of, oh crap, and not seeing what he sees. Oh crap. 
it just leaves the movie with a big uh, question mark and ellipsis that we'll be able to fill in if we're lucky enough to do a sequel. So that is Uncharted. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to this commentary. This film was a true joy to make. I encourage you to stay through the credits and appreciate all of our talented collaborators who contributed to this film. Each and every one of these people, the movie wouldn't be what it was without their contribution and they deserve the credit they're due. Especially these two men, Bob Dorman and Brian Rellier, who were our line producer and first assistant director who were at the center of all things Uncharted. Tom Elder Groby, I gave Chaz props, but Tom deserves just as many props as he was responsible for all the VFX alongside Chaz. And then just our incredibly international crew, literally people from all continents uh, gathered together in Spain and Germany to make this film. I don't know how many nations were represented, but um, more than I can count on two hands. And it was just a joyful experience despite all odds of a global pandemic we managed to make and uh, shoot and edit this movie. And uh, I'm incredibly proud of the way it turned out. So thanks to all for listening. And I hope I will see you again soon on Uncharted 2. All the best to all. <laughs>